Patrick Norris, welcome to Acquiring Minds. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Patrick, I'd been eager to learn about the trash business. And one day, an email from you pops up just a few months ago, and I'm going to read directly from it. Quote, in your interviews, Will, you always ask about needing an MBA or private equity experience to be successful. I had neither. I'm basically a blue collar worker. I bought a trash company, built it for five-ish years, and sold it. End quote. And I wrote back to you, Patrick, and said, you had me at trash. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm really looking forward to this. Let's get into it. Patrick, please start us off with some background on you. Yes. Um, so I went to college at LaSalle University in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And after college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I joined the Marine Corps. I spent four years in the Marine Corps between 2004 and 2008. Um, when I got out of the Marine Corps, uh, 2008 was around. So coming by jobs wasn't very easy. So I took the first job that I got offered, which was uh, working on the back of a trash truck for waste management in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I did that for with waste management for about a year. And then the contract that I worked under, um, they lost it. It went to a small company um, named Sunrise Scavenger. I worked for and um, I went with the contract to that new company, that different trash company. Um, I worked on the truck for about a year and then the owner of the company asked me if I wanted to be his supervisor. Uh, so he was a startup. He had started that company, um, to fulfill this contract. So, um, he, he was the manager at that point, And then he was just asking me basically if I wanted to do, um, the daily supervision of the company. Um, so I, it took a little bit, but I did say yes eventually. So I went from driving the truck to being the daily supervisor. Um, I worked and with how, him. How the superv as supervisor? How many people did you have under you, and and how big was the fleet? Sure. When I first started at that company, being the supervisor, we had about fifteen trucks. We probably had twenty employees. Um, we all worked in Dorchester, which is a section of Boston. So it was like real, really easy to control. Um, it is a union environment, which makes it a little bit different. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was a 15 trucks, 20 people. Um, and then it was me as a supervisor and then him as the owner. And then a couple of people that worked in the office, but I didn't do too much with them. So it was just daily operation. Got it. And how was it that he won this contract if his business didn't even exist? Because you said it was a startup just to serve this one contractor. This was customer number one. Correct. Uh, Joe, he's probably on his fourth or fifth company in his life at this point. So he had started as a younger person in the trash business um, and he had bought multiple companies over the years, sold multiple companies over the years. He had ventured out into other businesses as well, uh, but came back to trash. So he won the contract. The city contracts are um, bid out every five years. He wins the contract and then he sets the company up after winning the contract. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. Carry on with your story, please. Okay. So I work for him for, well, so I'm in that position. The company's growing. Um, he is essentially like a mentor to me at this point where, you know, um, I'm growing as his company grows. He's teaching me a lot um, as we go. The company eventually grows to um, like 45 trucks, 60 employees, and it's still, he's the owner, I'm the operations manager, um, one supervisor below me. Um, and then, so I run basically the operation day to day. That was probably six years that I did that. And then I started to get frustrated. Um, with the situations. So I started looking for a company to buy because I thought that, you know, I, I saw what he had done and I thought, yeah, well, I can do this. Um, so I just started looking on like biz, buy and sell at that point for a company to buy. Um, I ultimately found one. Um, so I left there to then pursue buying this company. I'll ask for more color on how you were frustrated, but just to set that up, 
There are a lot of operations managers out there in the world. Uh, I mean, every business has one and they don't all set off to go buy a business, but you did. Uh, so that's so you're making it sound like a, a a natural progression, but it's actually not. Um, so elaborate on on making this big decision and go striking out on your own to to buy a business. Yeah. Um, so in my dealing with other people who Joe had come in to do work for us, I talked to this one gentleman, and you know, I we were talking about the business and such, and. I had told him like kind of what I wanted to grow into in my career. And he said, you know, you should really talk to Joe about how he got where he got. And he said, you know, you're not going to get where you want to go unless you go buy a business. So and where was it that you wanted to go? Were you talking net worth? Were you talking, what were you talking? What, what was your <clears throat> goal? Yeah. I think what hit, what I was probably talking to him about is how eventually one day I would want to do what Joe was doing, have municipal contracts and have a business and his his advice was like, well, you're not going to get there by doing what you're doing now because you're going to have to strike out on your own and get some experience so that municipalities would um, be interested in working with you. Mm -hmm. um, most of the contracts say you need like five years operating experience before they'll, they're going to give you a contract. Um, so it was really that person's advice um, and just my talking with Joe like I had already known that Joe had owned multiple companies and, you know, he started out in his probably late twenties by buying a small company in the Boston area and growing it to the point where he could sell it to a larger company. So, um, I understand it's not like a natural progression, but I just thought, you know, if I was ever going to be that level of success as Joe, that this is what you had to do. Yeah. And, the frustration that you felt was what you already explained that you you wanted to get to a, a place where you weren't going to get to on this path or was there was the frustration referring to something else again yeah it's a multitude of things um at one point i wanted joe to teach me the business side so i understood how to get the trucks out on the street how to operate with the guys but i didn't understand like how to get the contracts the business side he didn't share any of that stuff with me at one point there was a conversation about how he would share all that information with me and then um at one point we had a conversation where he said he would not share any of that information with me so that's <laughs> all <laughs> ultimately on, on second led thought to the <laughs> maybe i won't share all that information with you <laughs> exactly so uh, and that was a similar time as this gentleman, Jim, who explained to me, like, yeah, he's not going to share that with you. If you want to do this, you're going to have to go do it yourself. All right. So Jim kind of makes it plain that you're going to have to go do this yourself. You're open to that. You do it. You what? You quit and then get on biz by sell or you're on biz by sell while still working at Joe's operation or what? what tell, yeah, it we're started the story. Out, yeah, it started out just looking on biz by sell. I think really ultimately I wasn't even married to trash. I was just like, okay, well maybe I'll find a business. And for a long time, I just, you know, would look at the website and see what I saw. At one point, I the company I actually ultimately bought, I actually showed it to Joe because Joe was looking for work to do with some trucks that we had sitting around the yard. And I he said, hey, I saw this on this website if you want to take a look at it. Um, he never told me what he did with it. But ultimately, um, I quit there and then got serious about searching. I had a house. I sold my house. I made the money that I was going to invest in this business by selling my house. So I had a multifamily house in Somerville, Massachusetts. I sell that. Um, I actually moved to Philadelphia for probably nine months while I did the search because that's where I grew up. So I didn't have any family or anything in Boston. So I moved home, did the search from there was open to businesses in Philadelphia, was open to stuff in Massachusetts. I had a girlfriend that lived in Massachusetts who's now my wife. Um, so it kind of just went like that. Um, and the whole time I had this business like that I kept looking back at, which was this trash company up here. I did look at two companies down in, in Philadelphia that I passed on. Um, one was like a oil recycling, um, vegetable oil, like food from, mm -hmm. from like restaurants and such. Um, and it was a one man show guy would go around, collect it in a van, take it back to some garage in Northeast Philadelphia 
and uh, turn it into a product that could then be sold to uh, like a to make biodiesel. Um, and I wasn't a fan of that business. Um, and then I looked at a carrier business, um, you know, like Final Mile type Morse type stuff, like small packages. They had people that, like lo- that uh, drove around in their cars and stuff like that. Hmm. And that was down in Philadelphia. Um, and I talked to him and eventually passed on that as well. Um, the problem with the oil company was I didn't like the fact that you're basically trading commodity. Um, mm. So you had to ride the price of the commodity. So mm-hmm. that guy, he had a couple good years. He had a couple bad years, depending on the price of, of the substance that he was creating. Mm-hmm. And then the carrier business, I was not a big fan of because there was a salesman there who basically had all the relationships. And mm-hmm. I figured I, if I bought that company and I didn't get along with the salesman, he could take my business in a heartbeat. So that's why I pass on that one. Okay. And so tell us about the, the trash business back in, back up in Massachusetts that you saw and liked. Yeah. So the trash business, um, it was a family operation, like a true family operation where um, the gentleman who started it, the business, it was him, his uh, son, his son's uh, wife worked in the company, his other son worked in the company and his wife. And that was it. So a true family business. Um, and they were all gonna, like once the transaction took place, all of them were gone except for the the daughter-in-law. She stayed around for a little bit. Um, but it was a small company. The advice that Joe had given me, I, you know, I told Joe what I was going to do. And ultimately he was like, um, I don't, I didn't recognize it till later, but he was excited for me to leave him to go buy something. He, no, I had no, he didn't care at all that I was leaving to go buy a company. I think that he thought it was like a great opportunity. His advice to me was go buy something that you can handle. Don't buy something that you can't handle. Don't buy something that's too big. Um, so he had told me like, don't go buy something bigger than a million dollars in revenue because it, it could be too big for you to handle. Um, so that's kind of like where I was looking. This business, the revenue when I bought it was six hundred and twenty. Four thousand dollars, six hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year. Um, it did have like an SDE of about one ninety. Um, so I thought that was pretty good. It was asset heavy in that it had like three hundred thousand dollars worth of trucks. Um, the benefit the trucks were actually fairly new, which when you buy a trash company, you're not going to find that because most people are going to use those trucks right to the end of their life, get the most out of them and then try to sell the business. But the, uh, father was like so fed up with the trash business that I think that he was just done mentally and he didn't care that, um, he was selling his trucks. I mean, one of the trucks was only a year old and he was selling it. I want to just circle back on Joe for a minute. So yeah, I had thought that Joe would be bitter that you were leaving because he offers to teach you the business side of things and then he reneges on that, presumably because he doesn't want you to go out there and compete or doesn't want to lose you or whatever. Um, But in fact, when you say, Joe, I'm out, I'm going to go do this on my own, turns out he's excited for you, but he doesn't share that at the time. Just curious. Um. He no, he did share it at the time, and I was so frustrated I couldn't see through the forest. That would be the way that I would put it. Okay, <laughs> he okay was very like excited, and then I mean, I gave him like three months' notice that hey, I'm going to leave in three months, and he multiple times asked me, "Hey, how's how's the search for the business going? Mm. How's this going?" He so he was not upset at all that I was leaving because maybe he understood that like. I, I had to leave to go do what I wanted to do. He knew I mm-hmm. wasn't going to get there by working as his operations manager. Mm-hmm. So, no, he was, but I didn't see it at the time. I, I was just kind of so frustrated with the situation that, you know, I kind of just brushed it all off. I kind of mm-hmm. regret that now, looking back and being, you know, eight years older. <laughs> well, I hope you sent him a bottle of wine when, when you know when, when you sold this business, which the audience will have to wait to for another forty five minutes to get there. But uh, worked out worked out pretty well for you. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, 
And then a little bit more on the Joe's advice, don't buy over a million in revenue. So as a listener to the pod, you have heard no doubt that buy as big as you can within reason, but um, generally it's hard to find a business of 750 or a million or 1.25 million in SDE, in SDE, not even revenue in SDE. Um, yeah. So if you find those, uh, you know, they're great. Um, and they're better than ones that are doing 200, 300, 400, 500 in SDE. So, but inter- but many searchers um, are, kind of are intimidated. They, they kind of are in line with what Joe would say. They're intimidated by too big a business, um, you know, wrapping their arms around that. The advice is to buy that big because a bigger business is more sturdy, is, is, is less risky, um, harder to screw up, probably has management. You know, it's just a more robust thing that it's going to be harder to screw up in theory. Um, so, um, interesting that Joe, uh, for a guy who is so experienced doing a bunch of these businesses, looking at you who had a lot of experience yourself now in the trash business, you're a star guy that his advice w- was so counter to what we hear in our, in our little world that, you know, bigger is better. Do you, so I guess the, the question would be, do you think in retrospect that it was a good, that it was good advice? Or do you think that you could have handled a $2 million revenue, do- re- revenue trash business? Yeah, no, I think it was, it was good advice. Um, he, he and I are both, um, like I would say command and control people. So like on a larger business, I don't, in a larger business, that has, you know, $2 million of SDE, you're not going to have the time to like really dive down into what the problems are. And he, I don't think he wanted me to get in over my head of like, this company has problems. Most trash companies have problems with rooting and they have problems with people. And a big company becomes harder to control all that. And a small company, I mean, I bought a company that had two trucks running around every day. It was pretty simple to control what was going to mm-hmm. take place. Um, so, and there's also like the economics of trash you get involved in that at that point, I didn't understand disposal, which is like the name of the game. And if you bought a $2 million trash company, I mean, a two million, if you bought like a $1 million SD trash company, uh, you're going to have problems with disposal and you better understand that going in. And I don't think he would have verbalized that to me, but now knowing my experience, that's what I didn't understand going into this. So having a small company and learning those lessons was actually probably the best thing. Mm-hmm. Well, we're gonna we're gonna revisit this concept of disposal because it's such a an important strategic um, consideration in this whole industry. So that that's great. But w- what about you know just pushing back a little bit on that, Patrick? You got you bought a business with two trucks running around. You know one driver calls in sick and your whole route is killed for the day. So how, how, yeah. how why didn't that, why didn't that concern you? Well, I, I mean, I can drive the truck. Um, and that, I mean, the whole, my whole thought process is when I took that company over, like I said, they had five people working there and it was going to be me and one other driver. And then I had a controller who worked for eight hours a week. So we we're going to, take their payroll and bring it way down right off the bat. Um, because I just had the, I knew that I can just step in and do the work that isn't like, if someone doesn't come to work, I just run their route for the day. And that's pretty normal on a small trash company, whoever your supervisor is, or if you're the owner, like you're going to be out there, you're going to be picking up trash. And I mean, I worked at that company for five and a half years and I probably spent more days on the back of it or driving a truck than I did not over the course of the five years. Great. Well, then returning now to the business, get a couple more bullet points about the business that you bought. So you said two trucks. You gave us the number of employees. How many like routes is that? Or is it, like in, in trash world, how many? Yeah. Like give us a sense of, yeah, what is that? So a full truck would be five routes, Monday through Friday, one route a day, right? So. Okay. Um, what they really had was seven routes. There was one truck that worked five days a week, and then they had a route on, um, I believe it was Monday and Thursday for a second truck. So I hired someone to do the full five routes, 
And then I was the guy who did the Monday and the Thursday when we first started. Um, and then, so then a, a route is a good route from what I was doing is like 300 stops a day, maybe 400, depending on the size of your truck and how close together all your stops are. Um, so what we were doing, which I haven't gone over yet, is strictly subscription-based residential service. Um, and in the trash business, there's like different types of service. You know, there's municipal service, commercial service. This was strictly um, in towns that don't offer trash service. So the municipality doesn't pay for it. So each household needs to go out and find a contractor to pick up their trash. And um, so 90, I would say 95% of our business was that there's 5% of like little bit of commercial work, um, but it was subscription based prepaid. Um, so the, it, it was a very focused piece of the trash business. You know, there's many lines of the trash business, but this was just one little factor of it. Mm -hmm. And did you like that about it? Do, do you prefer of all the many choices of of where where what niche you want to serve in the trash business? Do you like residential subscription? Yeah, so I mean, coming from my background, which was municipal, uh, sub, was municipal residential work. Uh, it my background played the best here, but now looking for like a, a small trash company, this is the perfect place to get started because everything's prepaid so you don't have any kind of cash flow situations taking place um you you know they're all paying three months some people are paying up to 12 months in advance of the service so you're never really worrying about money so as a small yeah. company it's a great place to try to play where if you do like let's say roll off containers you're doing all the work before anyone ever pays you and you may not see the money for 60 days before you know after you've already performed all the work um so this is like the perfect business in my opinion for someone who's starting um doesn't have the operating experience to kind of go out and buy a small business that already does this yeah i wouldn't say it's a great business to start because i don't know if you remember your septic uh guy from philadelphia yeah. And he was like, oh, that's yeah, a wow. It's an wanna... early episode, man. You, you, really, <laughs> you really went to the archives. Um, well, he, he he was like, oh, you don't want to start a septic company because you got to buy this expensive truck and then you don't have any customers to put material in. And the trash business is like the same way. If you're the guy who starts it, you're going to make it to a million dollars of revenue. It's going to take you a couple of years to get there and you're going to be kind of beat up before you ever. Uh, you ever really get going if that makes sense and by beat, beat up, up what i mean is yeah what trash company it's like it's 24 7 right because the trash never stops it's the blessing and the curse the blessing is it's always there the money's always there and the curse is is that it's always there and you better show up to pick it up because the second that you don't show up is when people start calling someone to get somebody else because nobody wants their trash barrels at the end of their driveway completely full so the, that's the like the saying in the trash business is a blessing and a curse. But to start that business, what I'm making the point is, is like you bought this $300,000 truck and you don't have any trash to put in it. It's going to take you, you know, a year or two to even when you start making money with that truck. Fascinating. And and um, on this point about getting beat, beat up and, and tying it to something you said earlier about the seller of the business that you bought, that he was so fed up and we're still going to get into the terms of that in just a second, but he was so fed up. He didn't really care that he gave you a great deal. What, so is that is that kind of what you're saying? He was just, there's a lot of burnout, even from owners, not just not just the guys humping trash, but the, the, the owners themselves. Yeah, I, there's a ton of burnout, I think, because um, you either have to get to that point. Because the trash never stops. Because the trash never stops. Um, you either have to get to that point where you can get in your first layer of management or eventually you'll get burnt out because, you know, not only does the trash never stop, but the phone calls never stop. And it's just like a constant, unless you just stop growing the company, right? Like if you just say, hey, I'm at a point where I don't want any more customers and stuff, um, 
it just doesn't stop. So if you try to run a lean operation, it will kind of work at you over the years. And especially mm-hmm. when you, if you're going to start from zero, it's definitely going to work on you over the course of five to 10 years. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I know like another guy who started his own business, but he got to that point where he finally put in a layer of management and then his life got much easier. Yeah. I mean, I hear you about the trash, but I I could probably identify a lot of businesses that have a relentlessness to them. But that's why you hire employees. <laughs> I mean, you, the idea is that you're spreading. I don't mean that you're dumping it on your butt, but I mean, you're spreading it out across a team and there are shifts. And, you know, I mean, a, at some point you want your, I would think the solution wouldn't be sell the business, but to grow to the point where you're big enough, that you have management, they have infrastructure, that you can afford enough people, that there are shifts and that everybody has a, a normal life rather than feeling like they're holding on by their fingernails to go pick up trash all the time. Um, yeah, but I, you know, it's probably, it's probably one of those valleys where you gotta, you gotta get across that valley and it's really hard to get to that next level of size to, to really get there. And I, that was probably, that's probably my biggest lesson mm-hmm. in the five and a half years that I did it. Right. So if I had to sit back and say, what's the number one thing that you learned? Number one thing that I probably learned was it would have been a whole lot better to spend a oh, extra hundred thousand dollars a year and put a manager in place. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I had done that, would I have felt how I felt at the end of the business? No. Um, but when I'm, when I was in the business, it's like, Oh, I think you're, I, I was taught to run a business on the razor's edge because that's how Joe was. Like we ran it every day. So that's what I thought was the right way to do it. Now, Mm. looking back, I, I think I would say to myself, well, I could have spent a little bit more money and uh, had a little bit better of like a work-life balance. Okay. Well, uh, speaking of that, you also, so you said one truck, one guy for the five-day routes, for the five-day truck. And then the other truck was just Monday, Thursday. You were going to do those routes. Um, But when I see trash guys outside, there's two guys in a truck or three. One guy's driving, one guy's, one guy's labor, you know, dump. Yeah. So what's that about? Well, so it depends. Uh, if you're running like a municipal contract where you have every single house for the whole community, you're probably going to have a driver and a labor. Like when we worked in Boston, we had a driver and a labor on every single truck. Um, and that was because just the number of stops you're going to complete in a day. When you do the subscription service, um, if you, if you can do one guy on the truck, obviously your margins are way better and there's a little bit more drive time. So it's a little bit more acceptable to not put two guys on the truck. Um, eventually like towards the, when my last year we had trucks with two guys on them cause our routes were so big that we could put two guys on it, still make money. And also with two guys on the truck, you get more productivity. So you do more stops in one day. So like when I bought the business, we had routes that had like a hundred stops on it. And as I said earlier, a good route has three, 400 stops. So a hundred yeah. stops in the course of a day, one guy can do it. Your break point is probably once you get over 300, you probably need to put somebody else on there. And so 300 or below, or like the hundred when you got in there. So you're, you drive, stop, get out of the truck, dump the trash out of the canister, out of the barrel, whatever. Can, yes. can get yeah. back in, keep driving. So, wow, that that's um, that that seems like a lot harder work, work than out. just being the <laughs> yeah in and out of the truck, and and like what's the distance between stops? stops. So obviously, it varies, but is it every block, one a block, or is it every ten minutes? That math um, probably doesn't work out. It's less than that. Yeah, probably, yeah. The math. If you're doing the stop every ten minutes, you might as well park the truck and go home. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, so it really, you would, you, I mean, at the end we were in towns where like we had half the town, but, uh, yeah. so you went, as you densify the business, everything becomes greater and that's when you can do 400 stops. I would say if uh, what I used to think in my mind that if I couldn't do a stop every two minutes, then we weren't not making good money. Mm. 
So mm-hmm. you're talking 30 stops an hour. And that strictly, this is strictly subscription-based uh, business. If you go into the other lines, it's completely different. But for what we were doing, um, I didn't think that we were making enough money if unless we could do 30 stops an hour. Now, we had roots at the end. We were doing 80 stops an hour, um, which was great. But but when it's when you have that density, you got two guys in the truck, and the yeah. driver's not getting down and getting up. He's just pulling yeah, forward a lot of ten, that is, ten feet or thirty feet, and pulling forward thirty feet, and pulling forward thirty feet, like the guys on my block hitting every house. Yeah, exactly. Even though even though mine is municipal, mine is not private. Yeah, and your guys, if it's a municipal contract, they're probably doing over a thousand stops a day. They're like loading oh, their wow. truck, going to the dump, coming back, loading it again. Wow. Okay, and then uh, Patrick, tell us a little bit. So, <laughs> this is my own uh, big city or big city suburbs uh, uh, background uh, showing. I thought everywhere just had the city, the city or the municipality or the town offered trash, and that's what your taxes are for. Everywhere, maybe yeah. except you know, if, if you had pressed me, I would have been like, well, yeah, I guess in rural places, probably not. You drive your stuff to the dump. But I, I think I really underestimated how many places in the U.S. don't have municipal trash. Um, so anyway, g- give us a lay of the land there. Like what what size cities or towns often don't have their own coverage and, and they have private businesses doing it? Uh, to be honest with you, I would have to make up numbers to answer that question. But I could tell you this. I'm 45 minutes outside of Boston and they don't allow for trash service. So we're, I'm not that far outside of the city of Boston. I would say um, we're maybe 15 minutes from the closest town that does offer the service. Um, mm-hmm. So basically, if you had a if you had a town of, let's say, 20,000 residents, you're probably going to be on that like break even point. Or like, Mm -hmm. uh, um, because one of the towns that we serviced was Hudson. And when at the end, after I'd sold my business, they actually switched to a quasi town service. And they were the Mm -hmm. big, the most dense town that we serviced. So when you start getting to that point, then the towns start to think, okay, there's too many people here. We need to start to think about offering a service. Mm -hmm. Um, It's basically, I think it's in line with, that towns don't want to raise taxes, but they want to have better yep. schools and they want to provide a couple other things. And also when we talk about disposal, eventually disposal gets so expensive for the town that the town is like, you know, we can't just take everything from residents. Like in Boston, they take whatever you put out because they don't want people throwing trash in the streets. But um, what other towns do is they start to limit what you can put out because they don't want to pay for all the trash that we create. Um, and then when you get out to kind of where I live, which is 45 minutes outside the city, they're kind of just like, you know, you can deal with it by yourself. Okay. Okay. Well, and so maybe now would be a good time to learn about disposal and transfer stations and how that works and that, <laughs> strategic nuance that's at play there as well. So so give us a little tutorial. Sure. So a company like Waste Management, largest trash company in the country, they control their trash from top to bottom. So like they pick it up, they put it in the truck, they own the transfer stations that the collection trucks go to, then they own what's called what I would refer to as like end site disposal. So that's like your landfills or your incinerators. Um and they so they own once they get the trash in the truck they control it from top to bottom and on in my case you know i just owned it once i put it in the truck and now i have to figure out how to get rid of it um when you do like a municipal contract sometimes the town the city is paying for that so you're strictly just paid to collect it the town tells you where to take it and then um they're paying the bill but on my end once it's in the truck, I own it. I can take it, you know, to any site that I want to take it to, and I have to go out and negotiate a price for every ton that I take to that site. So if I take it to like a transfer station, when I bought this business, we were paying seventy-five dollars a ton to get rid of trash. When I sold the business, we were paying one hundred and five. Right now, 
uh, that same transfer station is charging one hundred and sixty dollars a ton. So mm-hmm. I bought that business in twenty sixteen. You know, we're only <clears throat> seven, eight years later, and uh, they basically doubled the price of disposal, which pushes the little guys out because since they control it from top to bottom, what happens is now they have a cheaper price of disposal. So the stuff that they're picking up at the curb, they can get rid of obviously much cheaper than I can. Um, And the interesting part about it is a lot of times you are in competition with the company that you're taking the trash to. So they probably run a collection route in the same town that you do. They own the transfer station. You're taking it to them. So now you're in competition. Your competition can control your price to get rid of the material that you pick up. And obviously... There's only so many disposal sites that you can go to um, because you don't want to. And Patrick, I just got to interject. When you say disposal site, when you say transfer station, we're talking dumps. Uh, Is there a reason you're not using that word? (laughs) But I just, (laughs) we're we're just taking stuff to the dump. Uh, Just just want to make sure that's abundantly (laughs) clear to people. Go ahead. That is exactly what we're talking about is the dump. Transfer station is like, our collection trucks are dumping it in one spot. And then on the backside, they're putting it into like a tractor trailer. And then they're that tractor trailer is taking it to what you would call a landfill. When you go to a landfill traditional, like most landfills that I've been to, you don't see too many collection trucks in them because the the collection companies, they don't want to sit in the line and go to the landfill where it takes more time. So they want to go to a transfer station, get the material off the truck a little bit quicker. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's all basically a dump. Yeah. And, and the, and the transfer stations, the dumps are smaller. So, you know, they, they, they're, they're intermediate spots for trash. And then all, then, the, then all of these transfer stations, these dumps feed into an enormous landfill that's, you know, regional sort of thing. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then if it's not a landfill, it's an incinerator, but same idea, mm. all the different transfer stations are feeding into the incinerators. Well, let, let's just reiterate, let, allow me to reiterate this dynamic because it sure makes it seem like uh, as a small trash operator, you are at a significant strategic disadvantage. You have to pay to take your, tra- to, to tr- take your trash to the dump. Think of it like a toll and the toll is set by your direct competitor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who's who's also using their own dump and will just not charge themselves the toll, therefore have uh far less of their own costs and therefore exactly. charge charge less fees to the very customers you're competing with them for. So how is it how is this viable at all? Like why yeah. is it not why are you not immediately just shut down and out of the business? Um well once you, if you're not bothering them and you're not stealing too many of their customers, um, then they are making money off of you, right? So if you're their customer at the dump and you're bringing all this material to them, they're making money off you at the dump. So like I had the company that that ultimately purchased my company, we took all their our material to them, and they said to me at one point. Well, we would just rather have you do the collection. We'll make the money off you when you bring it to our transfer station. Hmm. Um, so it's kind of them realizing a little bit like they can't pick it all up. Um, mm-hmm. Two would be the big companies like um, the Waste Management, Republic, Waste Connections. Their service is horrible. Um, and there's a way for us to exist in the world of we're going to go out there and we're going to provide good service. Um, maybe people would pay a little bit more for it. Um, but yeah, so we can, we can compete because we can provide a much better service than the big companies can. Mm -hmm. And they basically determine that you're either too small to care about or that they actually, that you actually serve their interests in some way. You help absorb some of the demand that maybe they don't want to deal with. And like you said, they're, they're still, they're also profiting from your existence because they're charging you a toll to use their dumps. Exactly. Um, And so like you're just fitting in this little world of you can make good money 
just like playing the game and fitting into this spot where they can't pick it all up. Um, the thing is, is once you do become big enough and once you do become a problem for them, they control your disposal. So you do have to play nice, right? Like you can't go and try to take all their work because then you're going to be looking for another disposal site. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Um, okay. And, and now you mentioned the, th- the three biggies and waste management will be a name that most people recognize. That is a giant company. Um, people will recognize the name just because it's a giant company. We see their trucks, we recognize their logo, but it's also a, uh, one of the most well-known kind of case studies of a, of a roll-up. Uh, I can't remember the founder or buyer, the CEO, whatever guy yeah. who built waste management, what his name is. If you said it, I'd know it. Um, I don't know. I'd it. recognize it. I don't I'd recognize it. Okay. Um and he basically saw a fragmented industry and rolled up all of these small trash operators around the country and it and it became what is today waste management and it was big success. Um and so, you know, I would say to myself, you know, this in it, it it's kind of like the classic it's kind of like in our world, we we look at an industry. And one of the questions we ask ourselves is, how fragmented is it? If it's still fragmented, is private equity or is there somebody there or is there capital there rolling it up? So if I think about the trash business, I'm like, well, waste management long ago rolled rolled up this business. How can there still be opportunity there? Uh, so what what would be the answer to that question? In my opinion, it, it would be like a never ending cycle. So, mm-hmm. uh, and in my example would be this is that I sold my business and within a year, there were two smaller companies that popped up in all those towns to try to take from the larger company that I sold to. So I sold, and actually in this, a couple of the same towns, another company sold, we both sold to the same time. So their weight, the waste connections is who ultimately bought us. They um were rolling up this little region they had bought their um platform company in the new england region and then they were just buying up the some of the little players in that area and immediately two companies show up startups you know random guys in a pickup truck was one of the companies and now another one actually bought a trash truck but they started taking customers so in my opinion it's probably like a five-year cycle where you know they buy then the service isn't good so then people start to come back into the that area and again they can build a good customer base just on the fact that they these big companies don't provide good service and why do you think that the big companies can't figure out how to provide good service is it that is it an economic thing where it just doesn't make sense for them to, or is it just kind of the classic service tends to decline as a company gets big sort of dynamic? Yeah, I think it's probably the second one service declines. Um, we talked about earlier, like me and Joe are like control people, command and control. And at a yeah. larger company, you can't control everything, right? Yeah. So um, the management doesn't know the routes, the drivers know the routes. Um, and, you know, if that guy goes on vacation and the person they stick in the seat misses 10% of the route, we got a problem. Or just in like the culture of uh, COVID, you know, where you can't find truck drivers. Um, so if a guy goes on vacation, waste management will legit leave his route for the whole week. They just say, okay, well, we don't have anyone to do this. So we're just not coming. We'll see you next week. I mean, there were wow. multiple times where waste management would leave a whole town on for a month and they just, really? they don't have the people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Now in that situation, that is our horrible phone rings service. The hook. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah, no, it's so that, and our business was built on that. So like in the summertime when waste management stops picking up, our phone rings like crazy. And then all we have to do is show up. And like Joe used to say, this business is easy. You have a good price. You show up when you're supposed to be there. And if you mm-hmm. do that, you'll have a good business. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it totally runs in a cycle in what, in what I believe. I think the hardest part now compared to before is that um, 
the big companies really do control the disposal sites. So you yeah. have to understand the disposal piece. It, um, when I bought Mr. Trash Fan, the name of the company, um, I didn't think too much about disposal. And now going through the process, that would be my number one question. If I went to buy a company, a trash company tomorrow, the first question I'm asking is, where are we disposing of this trash? And what's it going to cost us? Because if the answer is, you know, we go to a waste management site, I'm going to pay a whole lot less for that mo- for that uh, business than if they say like, oh, we have a good deal over at this regional company. Um because you're going to get a much better price at a regional player than a national player. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. But you need to be really sure because even if the the cost is some X today, the price of dumping is X today, of course, it could, can and likely will go up. So I assume there are multi-year contracts that a trash company negotiates with a transfer <laughs> station to to lock in that pricing for some amount of time for, for certainty's sake. Once you begin... Once you become big enough, you can uh, negotiate a price. If you are one truck operation, they're not going to negotiate with you. They're going to say, like, here's your rate. And they're probably going to keep it for like a year or so. Um, A bigger player, you know, once you probably have, let's say, 10 trucks or so. I mean, I had like, I had six trucks when with four full routes and like i would get a 12 month price out of our but it was a regional company it was not a national player who can who had the transfer station they would give me a price for 12 months and i had a really good deal with them and they again we like played nice with each other um we like would we would trade routes at one point like i was in a town that they wanted all my customers and they said hey We'll give you all of our customers over here in this town if you give us all of our of your customers over here, and then we'll stay out of each other's way, uh, and then you have this nice disposal price over here. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. 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 So, it, there is a lot of working together. I think when you can find like a nice regional, larger company in your area that controls some stuff, I don't think there's any playing nice when you're running up against like a national company. Okay, good tip. So, um, first thing you'd want to diligence me. Well, one of the first things you'd want to diligence is the transfer station situation, the disposal piece of the business. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. This is just fantastic, Patrick. All right. So let, let's return to your story, your deal. Uh, <laughs> tell us, um, so reminder, everyone, it was doing 625 in revenue, about 190 SDE. Uh, two trucks in good condition and with a value at about 300,000. Yes, yeah, so there was actually three trucks. They had a, you know, a spare. Um, mm. And then, um, yeah, so the two main trucks, one was two years old, one was one year old. Um, the other one was at that point, probably eight years old. Um, and then obviously the other asset is the carts. So what? not only do you have to pay for the trucks but you pay for the carts that you put at all the customers houses right um Ah, so each customer gets Mm -hmm. a trash barrel and a recycling barrel some smaller companies do it we're like hey you go get your own barrels and we'll empty them but that really kills the economics of what you're doing the real reason you're giving them the barrels is so that you can say we're not taking anything outside of the barrels which means that you can estimate how much trash you're picking up every Mm. week Mm -hmm. so when you start saying like oh go get your own barrels and we'll just empty them. Now you can't estimate what your disposal is going to be. You can't control mm-hmm. that anymore. So that's the real mm-hmm. reason that the trash company is giving them out to you. Mm-hmm. And then all your rates are based on like what we, how much trash we think can fit inside that barrel. Mm-hmm. Um, just, and if you wanted to know 40 pounds of um, household of trash and like 20, 25 pounds of recycling um, each week coming out of the house. It's pretty, you know, different communities, depending on socioeconomics, that kind of varies. But if you use those numbers, you'd be pretty accurate. 40 pounds. Interesting. That, this week when I take my trash to the curb, I'll wonder. This is more or less than 40 pounds. <laughs> Typical family oh. of four, probably. <laughs> okay. Okay. We might be, might be a little light then. 
All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so tell so, us about the terms of the deal. Yeah. So the deal, I bought this company for six hundred and twenty-four thousand. Um, so basically, I kind of like went back and looked after our initial call and looked at some things. Um, I paid like one point eight of SDE, which is very low. So, and like I said, this guy who I bought it from, he was kind of done. Um, I, you know, said that the assets of the company were worth uh, three hundred thousand, and then on the SDE, I was only then paying three twenty five. So, it was a good deal, um, in my opinion. And it kind of ruined me for being able to buy a couple other companies because when I looked at my first couple companies to like add on to this. I was thinking like, whoa, why am I not getting the same? <laughs> why am I not getting this great deal that I got last time? And these, you know, the two individuals who I first spoke with about buying their companies, they were like, uh, no way, like that, this is not going to happen. And um, that, so it was a little bit of education there. And that's when I kind of realized that I had gotten this good deal. But so, yeah, I paid 624 conventional loan, a local bank. You know, they gave me the um, the loan on the assets. And then I had to come up with the rest of the money. So I had like over 50% of equity in it. I put in, you know, the 325 of my own money. And then I had that loan for 300,000 from the bank. Right. But wait, when, when you say 1.8 of SDE, I thought you said the SDE was 190. On day one, after I buy the business, I have $300,000 worth of assets. So what I he had to pay all these loans off. So he is walking with, I'm basically his SDE of 190. I'm only paying him 325 on that. Cause I have 300, I walk out of the deal with $300,000 worth of assets. Does that make sense? So if I liquidate exactly. the company on day one, I'm sticking 300, I have 300,000 of my money back right away. Exactly. So, so it was, he, you bought it for 624. But there was three hundred thousand dollars of assets in there. Yes. So, so, so really, so in terms of just the revenue that you bought, it was three hundred six twenty four minus three hundred is three twenty four. Is exactly. the way you're thinking about it, and three twenty four exactly. is about one point eight x of the one ninety um, of the one ninety SDE. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yes. Thank you. And so, as you learned, this was a sweet deal <laughs> and all because he was just burned out. Yes. And he knew that like his kids wanted nothing to do with the business. And I, I think his kids probably weren't capable of carrying the business on. And he, um, he was a very smart individual in my opinion. Um, but he knew that they were not going to carry this business on. So um, I think he was done. He had moved over an hour away from where he parked his truck. So for him to go to work, it now became a hassle. Um, and he was just kind of done with the trash business. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fair enough. Sorry. Circling back to the price again, it was yeah. 624, Four. but you also said the revenue was 625. So is that a coincidence or did he, was he thinking basically I'll sell it for one X revenue? I mean, that's a, Really, it, that conversation that never coincidence? came up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. He had it. To be honest with you, he had it listed at um, like seven fifty, and he had okay. it listed for two years. And I actually, my wife was very good friends with a business broker, and um, so my my then girlfriend, who's now my wife, said to me, "Hey, why don't you talk to Sarah about this business?" And um, she said, "Oh, I had that listed for two years, and this guy would not move on his price." So Ooh. now it was two years later, he was with a different broker. And I guess now he had realized like, well, I'm not going to sell this thing if I don't come off of this number. Yeah. Well, and he was two years more into his burnout, <laughs> a year, uh, an hour away. I mean, he was, he yeah, was ready. Exactly. Um, and margins. What do margins look like in, a, in this business? Yeah. You, I mean, from the day that I bought it until the end, we were, th uh, 25 to 30 um percent that that's a, like an EBITDA number it's not um like a net number at the bottom because there's obviously you're always carrying like a loan that you're going to be paying right so um 
but your EBITDA, you're 25, 30% easy. Joe always told me, like, if you do a contract, you, you price the contract so that your EBITDA number is 30% and don't go below that. Or he said, you know, you'd be in trouble. Because when you do a contract, you got huge uh, loans usually for the first five years because you have all the trucks and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And and yeah, so a, tr- a truck. How much does a truck cost, and how long does it last? I mean, how much do you, in your own mind, do you kind of factor in depreciation for the trucks? Yeah. So um, the now a truck is going to cost you like I bought a truck towards the end of my business when we paid three twenty five for it. Uh, you're talking four hundred thousand yeah. um, for like a really nice truck. So a brand new truck, you're talking three fifty, four hundred thousand um, dollars. You want to get ten years out of it. Um, after ten years, you're going to start to like the body's going to be pretty beat up. So you're going to be putting a lot of work into the body. Um, I mean, after five years, you're going to be putting work into it. A trash truck, you can count on like twenty to thirty thousand dollars in maintenance and repairs every single year. Um, and that's after one year. So you run that truck for one year, you're like putting tires on it, just changing the oil and, and keeping up with filters and stuff like that. Um, and then things are going to start to go wrong because, you know, you're pretty hard on the trucks. Um, a lot of stopping and starting. And then there's the whole, um, the hydraulic system, which brings like Mm -hmm. a whole new level of expenses, right? Cause if you're just running a dump truck, it's a lot cheaper because there's only one cylinder on it to make it go up and down where a trash truck has, you know, maybe I'm going to say eight to 10 cylinders on it and all these hoses and sensors and all kinds of stuff. And it, it, um, the maintenance is pretty expensive over the years, but if you can Mm -hmm. get, like, if you bid a municipal contract, you're going to pay for the truck in the first five years. And then you're going to try to get the contract for the second time. And then you're not going to have any loans. You're going to, so that's like where you make your money is that second five years when you're not paying off the trucks, but you can hmm. still run them. Hmm. Okay. But those 25 to 30% margins EBITDA. So not in, so that does not factor in, of course, the heavy expense of the maintenance expense of the trucks and loan expenses. No, well, no maintenance expense would be above that. Right. It's just right, sorry. paying off your, it would just be paying off your loans. Um, right. Like when I had, my business, I mean, we, we had like three loans that we were paying because every time you bought a truck, you got now you got another loan. Um, so it is like search. I think people, you know, they don't want a huge capex, right? Right. In this business, there's a lot of money in uh, buying the barrels, buying the trucks. Um, so there is a big capex here, uh, but I think the margins are are decent enough to explain it or like Mm -hmm. to justify it you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then ultimately um if you're going to run the business for 10 years hopefully there is some time in there where you have trucks that you're not paying for anymore and then you we will make good money on those routes yeah yeah but you know, if you're growing, which you hope that you are, you're also always buying, getting new routes that you have to get new trucks for. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess you think of ter- things in terms of like the profitability cycle, life cycle of a particular route. So of a particular Correct. route, yeah, for the first five years, it's more expensive. You pay off the truck. The second five years, it's it's pretty gravy, right? Something like that. It, yeah. It, yes, that would be kind of one way to think of it. Definitely mm-hmm. in like the municipal world and where things are contracted, it is definitely that way. Um, in the subscription world where nothing's contracted, it's, I think, a little bit different of a mindset. Um, of course, because your roots are f- always in flux because people, you got churn, people, new, new customers, other customers churn out. Right? Exactly. Yes. Mm-hmm. So one thing about churn in this business, I think what you have to think about is mm-hmm. real estate. I would say the majority of this of the subscription service turns over because of people coming and going in housing. So, mm-hmm. you know, you move in, you got to find a trash company. If that trash company does a good job, you never change. Um, so you could live there for 10 years and the whole time you have one company. Um, so I was having a conversation with someone recently who wants to do what I did and 
I said, you know, I don't know what the current housing market is going to do to this business because, you know, in the summertime, we would have months where we got 200, 300, uh, 300 new customers in a month because of people coming and going out of their houses. Now, if we got 250 customers, we may lose 100 too. So we're still positive 150 for the month. But my point to this gentleman was last summer in the town I live in, there were five houses for sale. So mm -hmm. that opportunity to grow the business in a cold real estate market is going to be less than in a hot real estate market because you're just not going to have that house changing hands, which is the open door for the business to grow. Okay. Interesting. I, I find I found that a little counterintuitive because I would have thought, I, I mean, I guess I, it all comes down to that ratio that you just gave where if there's people move coming and going in a neighborhood, you assume you're going to generate more new business than you are going to lose business. But why, why, why do you make that assumption? Why did you say, you know, we might get two, why do you get 250 customers, but only lose a hundred? I would think it would basically kind of net out all things being equal. It'd basically be a wash. Well, we were the best trash company in town. Yeah. So, so that's where our reputation was the, the way that people found us mainly was our website and our website, um, was set up so that through basically them going on to our website, putting their information in, and two email exchanges, our service would be set up. No phone call. Um, I could be out on a route and basically be signing people up at the same exact time because literally it was one email that I would just have to respond to acknowledge the fact that they were going to be set up. Um, so... E the ease of how our website made it so that people could sign up, I think got us a lot of customers. And also all these little towns have these Facebook pages and someone goes on the Facebook page and says, Hey, what trash server? I just moved into town. What trash server should I use? And if 50 people go on there and say, Mr. Trash Man, we're going to get it. And that's exactly what it was. My wife used to like monitor each town that we operated in their Facebook page. And she would say, Hey, you know, 50 people in Hudson said today that you guys were the best company. So you're going to get some phone calls. And that's exactly what would happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. Mr. Trashman, that's so cool. Okay. Um, Patrick, have we learned everything we need to about the kind of the lay of the land of the trash business? We talked about um, trash never stops. Uh, um, people don't cancel it's as long as you're providing good service or if they move. Was there anything more to say about municipal contracts versus the residential where you played? Um, you had said earlier that you got into it. You, you, you know, your aspiration when you were still working for Joe is that you get these muni municipal contracts. Contrast um, those two types of businesses for us. A municipal trash business where you're basically contracted by the city and un operating under the banner of the city versus private. Yeah. Um I think municipal is still a great space to be in. Um, or the business that I was in, um, it's obviously like a smaller business. It's more like a niche business. Um, the municipal contract business is, I think it's a great business to be in once you have the operating experience. Like I said earlier, to get one of those contracts, you need some operating experience first. It's hard to do a startup with no experience in the background. Um, but once you have this experience, you know, the, one of the municipal contracts we have for the city of Boston, and this was 10 years ago was like $7 million. So it's a big chunk of work to grab all at once. Um, it is the positive of that is that you're not hamstring by disposal. So if I was going to start, if I was going to mm, go back yes. into the trash company today, where, where I live, disposal's very tough. So if I wanted to go back into the trash business right now, what I would do is take my five years that I have of operating experience and try to go get a municipal contract because now I don't need to play the disposal game because the town's going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. On like a on a small municipal contract, so like let's say you have like a small town that has like two trucks, the town is not going to cover disposal. So 
what you what you kind of need is like a mid-sized town so like not the city of boston but maybe a suburb of boston so maybe Mm -hmm. one or two towns outside the city they're still going to cover their disposal but they're not a huge contract so that would be like a great spot to start Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and you don't have to play the disposal game there are there's like a town that's close to me but it's like a one truck town and you actually have to cover their disposal so you're responsible for getting their price um but the di- the biggest difference between the subscription business and the municipal contract is that it's easier for a small player to get into the subscription business cuz you can start with like that one little truck one guy doing it all and starting to grow that business out yeah yeah is that the answer that you you were yeah, thinking of that's great no that 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 was great patrick um and now tell us what is labor like? Is it a, is it an easy business to hire for? Some something tells yeah. me it's probably not. <laughs> In my experience, labor uh, labor is very hard. Next to disposal, it's probably your biggest turtle. Um, obviously, everyone knows CDL. Um, people with CDLs in this country just get smaller and smaller all the time. So it's a competitive market because there's not a lot of people out there with CDLs and to drive a larger trash truck, you definitely need a CDL. The federal government a couple of years ago made it even harder to get your CDL than it was before. So it's just a continued hurdle. And then we talked about earlier, you know, getting in and out of the truck, lifting up the barrels. It's a physically demanding job. And I would say that your success rate in the trash business is somewhere maybe 15% of people will make it a year. So, you know, 85% of people within the first year will not make it. And it's just because it's physically demanding. Now, as we talk about like automated trucks, so like, I don't know where you live, but now they have trucks where like an arm comes out, grabs the barrel and the, yeah, the driver never gets out. Yeah. Um, I think that number is probably getting easier. So, you know, maybe now you're at 30% of people will last because now you don't have to get out of the truck. You just have to be successful in driving it. Um, And again, I think, you know, we didn't have any of those trucks in my business. And if I was to go and do it again, one of the things is, is I would want to have those trucks because now my hiring is easier. And I had the rear load style truck where the guys are getting out and they're working harder. So, but those trucks where the arm grabs, they cost $400,000, right? Which is nothing for waste management, but for, you know, Mr. Trash Man, that's a lot of money to be shelling out for a truck. Um, So, uh, you know, it's a hard business. Then you have unions when you get into the city. So then you have unions to deal with. Um, Just a, when I bought Mr. Trashman, the guy I bought it from said you could hire a driver for 18 bucks an hour, right? And when I first started posting jobs, I posted them for $20 an hour. And I used to get a lot of applications. This is in 2016. When I sold my business in 2021, I would post for $26, $27 an hour, and no one would call. Hmm. So in five years, we had increased the rate uh, seven dollars an hour, and we're you know nine dollars higher than what this guy I bought the business from, and uh, we couldn't get anyone to take the job. Yeah, and and of course that was before inflation. That was before inflation really kicked off. So this is not <laughs> this is not a because you weren't keeping up with inflation or something. You you no. had really increased your prices a lot. They're, they're just the the supply of of drivers had gone way down. Yes, and, exactly. And I, I think mm-hmm. it's also a generational thing in that you know uh, people don't want to work on a rear load trash truck. You know, mm-hmm. um, one of the things that I would get frustrated with with employees is they would be there for a year and then they'd have their experience and then they'd go work at waste management where waste management would put them in a truck with like the one arm. And so now mm-hmm. their day is a whole lot easier. And I would probably have made the same decision if I was them, if I could make like the same money and now I just have to sit in the truck. Of course, yeah. that's what you would do, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
huge difference getting up, <laughs> at, up and down out of the truck and picking up. I mean, that is incredibly physically strenuous. Exactly. 300 times a day picking up trash and dumping it. I mean, you must get all kinds of, frankly, you know, um, back, you know, injuries. Injuries are probably not uncommon. Just because of the Your repetitive nature of this weird, you know, your this weird movement of of kind of taking this big canister, both arms over your head, sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, workers' comp's huge. Uh, yeah. P- so yeah, the, the, it there is the people get hurt. It's actually uh, top ten. I, at one point, it's top five most dangerous jobs in the country. It was more dangerous than being a cop or a firefighter um, because you're dangerous in traffic. Half. People um, getting killed, getting hit by car, you hit, yeah. you by, you hit by cars. Wow, wow. Yeah, that and just like it, it's an industry. So you also talk about like people getting hurt at like the processing facilities and stuff like that. But you know, people getting hit by cars, people getting hurt by like not knowing how to use the trash truck appropriately. Um, accidents. Think about truck accidents. How bad they always are. If a truck gets in an accident, nothing good ever comes of it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it is a very dangerous industry. Um, a lot of training has to go into it to be successful. A lot of safety and and such. And Patrick, what about the fact that you're dealing with trash? This is a dirty job. Is yeah. that uh, is that we haven't even addressed that directly? Is that an issue, or is that really kind of a minor issue when when you compare it to just how hard the work is, how just physically demanding the work is? Yeah, I think. Um, there are some people who, you know, after a couple of days on the truck, they're like, "Hey, this job's not for me. I don't want to be, co- I don't want to be, sh- you know, have fluid shot at me that I don't know what it is coming out of the back of the trash <laughs> truck." <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's dirty, it's smelly, it's uh, not fun. After a while, you just get used to it, right? Like, you know, don't put your head there because things are going to come flying out. Um, it, yeah, so there's definite, definite people that in the job interview. In the job interview, I used to c- try to convince people not to take the job. Like, I'm going to tell you right now why you don't want to do this. And if they... And, and what it, were the things that you'd say? Oh, just it's hard in the summertime when it's 100 degrees and you're jumping in and out of the truck and you're sweating and you're tired. And, um, you know, you're outside all day. In the wintertime, it's 10 degrees out and we're trying to pick up trash. Um, the long hours, the, you know, a, a typical trash truck driver... Definitely works between 55 and 65 hours a week, right? So mm. it's a lot of hours um, and a lot of physical activity. You're outside in the elements all the time. So y- y- I would try to explain to these people this is what you're get. This is what you're signing up for. And there are plenty of people who, in the interview, will be like, "Oh, I, I didn't think of it like that. You know, I thought I was going to be driving a bus. You know, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm that we you want to weed them out because of the expense to keep hiring people right when i first bought mr trashman um i it took me a month and a half to find a guy to stick and literally like every day i was interviewing people and new per- people every other day showing up until i actually found someone who's you know i've had people work for one day and come back at the end of the day and be like oh this isn't for me wow Patrick, the way you make it sound, it wouldn't be for me either. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's an, it, it's actually enjoyable once you get used to it. You're out, it, you know, you spend most of the day out by yourself. Like, you know, no one's watching you. You just do your route. And usually as long as nothing happens, you don't hear from anybody. It's really for a certain individual who likes um, some autonomy in their day. Yeah that they yeah. can control what they're doing and their day in the trash business. One of the things I like about it is there's an end, right? Like if you're an accountant, you can keep looking at numbers, right? Like you can open up yeah. the next file and start working yeah. on that guy's taxes. If yeah. you're a trash truck driver, eventually you get to the last stop and you get to go home and you get to control a lot of that day of how long is this going to take me? Mm-hmm. Which <laughs> again, when you talk about employees, one of the things as a business owner that you have to do is you have to control how long that day is going to be for that guy. And one of the struggles is if I say this takes, you know, if I say that your week should last 50 hours and you're making it last 60, you know, we, we have a problem 
And in today's environment, like there's a lot of people that want to take a 50 hour work week and turn it into a 60. Well, Patrick, I'm just watching the clock and we still have a a bunch of juicy topics to hit. So I'm going to move us along here. Tell us what you grew the business to. So so we'll start at the end and then tell us how you did that. So recall 625 in revenue. What did you grow it to? Uh, 2.9 million in revenue. So what is that? Four times, four plus times. Yeah. Great. How did you do that? Well, mainly showing up when we were supposed to. So good having service. that reputation, good service. Um, again, we talked about our website, how easy it was to sign up for the service and that the people literally could get it done in like 10 minutes and it would take uh, two me emails. Um so it and was this very was something e- that you implemented. The previous owner, it was not so seamless. You implemented this uh, correct uh, on bo- onboarding thing. Yeah. So mm-hmm. the prior owner had a website. Um, my brother in law, he knows how to build websites, so he built me a website, and we changed a couple things. Uh, we kept like the basic same layout, but. I mean, we made it so that if you Googled trash service in the towns that we operate in, we popped up first. We paid mm-hmm. Google for that, right? But, you know, it was short money for the amount of customers that we got because of it. But if, if you Googled trash service in such and such a town that we operated in, we were always the first one to show up. So that was a priority. The way that we built the website, he built it so that we were always showing up high in the Google searches, we were paying Google for Google ads, which was, uh, worked well. Um, so the ease, the ease of our billing was everything was very straightforward. Um, I'm kind of like a black and white person. Um, and I made it so that our service was black and white. So I don't think that the customer is always white, right. But I think that if they understand that this is what we're providing you, they can live with the fact that you tell them no, right? So upfront, just be very clear with this is what we're agreeing to do with you. And then you'll have that reputation of fulfilling at least what you said you were going to do. Um, and I think that while I think our customers appreciated that we communicated well we had a reputation for communicating well. If things went wrong, we had a way of notifying everybody like this is what's going to happen today. Um, and I think the big companies, they don't, they're not good at that stuff. Um, they're not good at communicating. So when their truck does go down for the day, they're not good at communicating. Like we're not going to be there. And people are just left to wonder where we made sure that everybody knew like what was going to take place. Um, I think we ran on a tight budget. And therefore, it allowed us to have a l- money whenever we needed money so that we could grow the business, right? Um, so that was the, one of the benefits is that we, whenever the opportunity was there and we wanted, and I wanted to do something to grow the business, I always had the money to do it. And it wasn't a problem to go buy a truck. It wasn't a problem to go buy barrels. Um, and I think running on that, in that tight environment, even though we talked about earlier, like, maybe I, sh- I ran it too tight, um, allowed me to grow the business. Um, yeah. consistent, how, how many trucks did you get to? Uh, four full routes, so 20 routes uh, in the course of the week. So four full trucks. We had six. You know, you always have to have spare trucks in the trash business. You can't just run with four because one's always going to be broken or there's going to be something wrong. Um, so we had seven employees at the end on the operational side. Um, you know, we had three trucks that had two people on it, one truck with one guy on it. Um, so yeah, we had grown it significantly from the original seven routes to a full 20. I did have two employees who were extremely consistent that you could count on, like without a doubt, uh, two drivers who one of them was there the whole time. Basically I hired him, uh, six weeks after I bought the business and he was there the day we sold it. I actually had a phone conversation with him today. Um, And so without him and the other, his name's Adelson. The other guy's name was Alonzo. Without these two people's commitment to like coming in every day, just like I came in every day, we wouldn't have grown the business. 
because they knew these routes inside and out. They could provide great service. They never missed anything because they were there for so long that they knew what was going on. We didn't have this extremely high turnover rate. Um, finding the third guy like that was very hard. I think right before I sold the business, I hired a guy that could have developed into that. But, you know, having those two very consistent pieces really made the business. You know, the observation I was going to make, Patrick, is that like what you did to make this a success and to grow this small business, in some ways, it's it's kind of what you always hear in our world, which is um, just kind of do everything in a pretty obvious, according to a pretty obvious best practice. Well, so solve your people issues to the extent that you can. But then in terms of in terms of just provide, you know, like you've said now multiple times, providing good service, providing a seamless user experience uh, and just, you know, and, and being responsive and being easy to communicate with uh, and, and kind of not to minimize that because that all takes hard work and consistency. But there's no kind of secret sauce necessarily. And and it's just, you know, the other kind of cliche, the cliche you hear is that, you know, just in small business land, you know, just pick picking up the phone, like answering the phone, you know, puts you puts you ahead of the com competitors. And it is start start what you're describing starts to feel like that's a little bit true here as well. Yeah, it's a hundred percent true. I had a the perfect example of that is I had a competitor, small business, family business, and I a couple of times had tried to call this guy to reach out to talk business with him. He would never answer his phone. So every time you called him, it went to an answering machine where if you called our business, I answered the phone. I had a cell phone and that was our company line. And I was the guy who answered it for five years. So when people called Mr. Trashman, they got the owner every single time. Mm -hmm. um, and people knew that, like, that's who, well, when you answered the phone, you were going to end up speaking to the owner, which is kind of difficult to transfer away from. Eventually, we, if I had not sold it, we would have had to transfer away from that. Um, but no, I, th I think it is totally about how you can make this easier for people to sign up for your service. Um, there's a guy that I know who's trying to sell his business now. He still like charges for each single pickup that he does instead of just giving people a monthly rate. So mm. like if there's five pickups in the month, he's giving them one price. If there's four, he's giving them another. And it's like, mm -hmm. he spends more time doing invoices because he has to go through how many pickups he did mm -hmm. for each customer mm -hmm. then where I just gave everybody a flat rate and you know, yeah, one month you get me and the next month I get you, but it yep. all works yep. out in the end. Yeah. So yep. I, yeah, you, you just um, try to streamline the best you can try to make it easy, whether it's the customer experience or your experience. Um, like the employees, they want it, their day to be easy. Figure out a way to make their day easier and they'll stay, right? So whether we're dealing with the customers, whether we're dealing with the employees, like figure out the way that is the easiest for everybody. And I think you, you're going to be more successful. Let's hear now about your sale, Patrick. Uh, what what did you... What the So the business, you got the business to 2.9 million in revenue. So as we said, you more than quadrupled it. Um, yeah. What did you sell it for? What what can you share about numbers here? Sure. I sold the business for four point four million. And on the day I sold the business, I had a million dollars in the bank. <laughs> so the That's bank amazing. account for the business had a million dollars in it on the day I sold mm -hmm. it and I sold it for four point four. So um we had no debt. I had paid Congra all the debt. Congratulations, off. by the way, Thank on you. behalf of everybody listening. That's a very impressive feat. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. So at the point I'd, so I'd paid all the debt off. We had no debt. Um, going into the sale, it just made it easier that there was no debt. Um, what I ended up doing is I sold to the comp the regional company that I worked with for the five years that I owned this business that gave me a good disposal rate and we would trade routes. They sold to Waste Connections, third largest company in the country. And after they sold, they came to me and said, you know, Waste Connections will buy your company. Um, I figured 
that Waste Connections would uh, beat me up on disposal rates over the years. So I, you know, I was interested in the deal right from the beginning. I figured that my disposal rate was going away. So um, yeah, and they offered me more money than I thought the business was worth. And frankly, you know, it was an easy, easy decision when they offered me what they offered me. And and so to be clear, um, we're we're now hearing again about this this strategic tension with the with the transfer stations. You actually had grown to the point where you thought you were big enough that your transfer station provider, uh, Waste Connections, was was actually going to. It was likely that event, maybe not tomorrow, but eventually it was going to start squeezing you on um, the fee to use the dump there, and so. Yeah, they were they were going to start caring. So you kind of you kind of start to reach a ceiling, sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. I think that unless you can figure out a way to control disposal, you start to reach a ceiling. And your ceiling is like either this business is going to cost a lot of money to keep reinvesting into, or you can't afford the squeeze of whether it's you know the 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 disposal or the fuel or the employees. But as, as you get bigger, that squeeze is coming from like all levels. Um, and in this scenario, you know, Waste Connections did end up squeezing everybody. Part of it has to do with the fact that like disposal in Massachusetts is very hard. So their disposal rates are going up. So they're not necessarily doing it to get every, to take to put people out of business, their prices, their disposal is going up because the state of Massachusetts, they're not opening up any more landfills. So they're, mm. they can't get rid of the trash any more than um, before. So that's why the price is going up. Um, just a little piece of that. Uh, the trash, a lot of the trash here ends up in Alabama and South Carolina. So that's how far it's going to get to a landfill. So think about how much Gosh. it costs to get the trash from yeah. Massachusetts to South Carolina. And that's why the price is just exponentially going up over time. Wow. So I, if I'm seeing a tractor trailers on the, on the interstate, some of those could be just filled with packed down trash. Yeah, that's actually what I do now is I drive for a tractor trailer full of trash. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, um, so that's usually like a short haul, like two hours, but they put it on trains um, and they have whole trains that go from Massachusetts down south into these landfills. Uh, well, we'll, we'll not uh, <laughs> think too hard about how much how much garbage we are all producing. Um, but that's exactly. Uh, Side note, that's just such a depressing um, reality. Um, I know. All right. So, and you bought it, r remind us when you bought it, 18? 2018? 2016. 2016. 2016. Oh, and you sold yeah. in? 2021. Oh, you sold in 20, yeah, there it is. Sold in 2021. Okay. So, yeah. So, five-ish years to, to sell a business for $4.5 million and have a million dollars in cash in the bank, which you- which I assume they let you take home. You didn't need to leave any anything in there for working capital. No. So um, one of the things the service is pre pre um, prepaid pre build. So when I sold the business, you know, I you do have to give them all the work that you didn't do. So you know, if you sell in the middle of a quarter and there's still two months left, you've collected two months worth of work right. that you haven't done yet. So you do have to give that money to them at close. So like in this scenario, that was four hundred thousand dollars roughly mm -hmm. um, that I had that they kept. So you know, they bought the business for four point four. They actually gave me four million because they of the four hundred thousand dollars of unearned revenue um, that was still on the books. So four point four, they kept four hundred, gave you four, and then you got to empty the bank account, which had a million into it. A million, yeah, in the, yeah. In, correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. So five, so five million to you. It was all. It's an asset sale, right? So you yeah, know they're buying exactly. your trucks, they're buying your bins, they're buying your customer list. Exactly. That is just so cool, Patrick. I mean, real. I mean, seriously. Uh, congratulations. I mean, good for you. I appreciate it. It's uh, uh, what's what's Joe say? What's Joe think? Unfortunately, Joe passed away in uh, twenty nineteen. Oh, no. 
Oh, okay. So, okay. Uh, again, when I look back and say, I wish that I'd handled that situation better. Ah, um, I see. It, I, don't, it. I never got the chance to fix that. Uh, okay. Okay. We've touched on the fact that, um, I, I just have in my notes here, I, I did want to talk about the um, hiring another driver because for this whole time, your whole tenure in the business, you were driving a truck. Yeah, off working. and on. Yeah, there off was more on. times. Yeah, more times that I was driving than I probably wasn't. Yeah, my wife. So here's a good mm-hmm. one for you. My wife likes to tell everybody that when our two kids were born, um, I left the hospital within two hours to go back to work. Yeah. So yeah. like once the kids were born, and then our parents were there, um, and then I said, "Okay, w- we're good here," and I went back to work that day. <laughs> <laughs> we're good here. <laughs> we're good here. Newborn. Okay. But in retrospect, you you do feel like that might have been a little too much command and control personality. I mean, you should have, you know, the, the business school Definitely. textbook would tell you, you should have been delegating that. Should have and could have. Correct. Yeah. yeah. It, in, if I did it all again, I that point where I layered in another layer of um, management, I definitely would have done that sooner. I probably could have sold the business for more money had I done it because I would have been able Mm. to spend a little more time evaluating my business rather than being on a trash truck. In the last year that I had that business, I'd made two attempts to uh, partner up with some people um, because I had realized that it was too much for like one person. And honestly, if, if I did it again, I think I would seek out an interested party right off the bat. Right. Like let I, I need somebody else here who's just as invested as I am. Um, and because if you have two people who are highly invested, it's going to be way easier than just one person. Sure. Uh, of course, you're, you're splitting the pie. So there's always that calculation. We but just got to grow you, it you, bigger. You, yeah. But, then, <laughs> but of course. No, but yeah, but that really, really is it. Well, and so, so that, that's a great segue. Um, and, and, and by the way, in case the audience is wondering, yes, we are going to get to the mafia question, but we've got to wait till the end. <laughs> uh, so wrapping up here, Patrick, so for the listener who mm-hmm. um, is interested in buying a business, you, you know, Joe had done this time and again, then you went off and did it. Uh, you explained earlier this dynamic of, you know, the, the big guys gobble up the little guys and then the little guys are gone. There's green space and 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 other, you know, upstarts pop up to to start doing trash again. So it seems like there's perpetual space in this in this industry and a lot of uh, it's, it remains a lot of kind of fragmentation. Mm-hmm. So what would you tell you? you you're a listener. You I think you understand uh, the audience. What would you tell them about this opportunity? Do you think it is an opportunity for somebody out there? Yeah, I think it's it's definitely an opportunity for people out there. I think you have to understand your local market and that there's probably some markets out there that this isn't going to work because of you can't find the disposal or it's uh, just too dominated by the bigger players. Um, But if you understand the market and you can find that you know, smaller company that has just a couple trucks and maybe they're a little bit beat up and you, and you could buy one or two of them. Like if you could go, if you could find a market that had two of these companies at 600, go buy both of them. And then you, you, you walk in at a better situation on day one. Um, so I think that's where it's the local, um, if you can understand the disposal and understand what's going on in your little environment, as I said, we worked in 10 different towns, right? That's not a big area. We didn't try to take over the state of Massachusetts. We didn't try to take over New England. We just wanted to compete in these 10 towns right around us. So I, I think that answers your question. There's definitely an opportunity there. I think something else is like, we haven't touched on private equity loves trash. There's a lot of private equity in trash as you get bigger because we talked about earlier big capital expenditure so you take a smaller company and as that company wants to grow they're gonna need private equity at some point to grow their company you know take a 10 million dollar company to turn it into a hundred million dollar company 
like one guy normally can't do that by himself. So he's going to need private equity to push him over the level. Mm -hmm. Um, and even I was thinking about it in like your guys framework or the search framework of self-funded traditional funded. Mm -hmm. If you're a self-funded searcher and you buy a small business, your whole goal could be just to grow it so that a traditional search fund is interested in it. Mm. Right. And you're mm -hmm. going to make good money. Right. So instead of saying, Oh, I have to buy a company with a million dollars of SDE, you can be a self funded searcher buy this small company and just get it ready so that a traditional search fund would be interested in it. Cause a traditional search fund is essentially a small private equity company. Anyway, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you're just preparing it for that level. And then mm -hmm. you can sell it or bring them into the equation um, and stay involved in the business. So that's like kind of how I see this traditional and self-funded search working out in the trash business. That's kind of how I would look at it. That's awesome. That's great, Patrick. Well, and it also feels like it, it, I've never um, articulated this. Maybe it's true in every industry, but getting from level one to level two, level two to level three, level three, level four it gets increasingly hard in the trash business uh, for reasons that we've just been talking about. But getting from level one to level two, meaning 200 SDE to a million SDE, that's probably the easiest, in quotes, <laughs> the <laughs> easiest of the levels to, to, to get to, to move yeah, think from between. And, and, uh, and yet, and, and yet highly, highly, uh, rewarding if, uh, i mean you can you can make a huge amount of money as an individual if you can take it as you did if you can take a trash business from 200 to a million in sde exactly i think it's because at those lower levels you don't have the good multiples but then you get really good multiples once you've gotten to that you know kind of that level that we got to or even better you know if you had revenue of 5 million, your multiples now are going to be really good because you're going to open that door to people who can actually pay good multiples and are yeah. interested in doing it. In our pre-call, we kind of talked about there's this space that we're living in where like these little companies, like less than a million dollars in revenue, like private equity doesn't want to deal with them. And also waste management doesn't want to deal with them. And if you call waste management, you're like, hey, I have this company of a million dollars of revenue. They're like, oh, you're too small. Like, we don't want to deal with all that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you're kind of in this little niche here where there's a good size company that you can take to the next level pretty easily. Yeah. And just to zoom out, I mean, a lot of kind of what we talk about here and the dynamics at play here, even a self-funded searcher is a version of private equity. And it's all, <laughs> a lot of it is, doing the hard work of taking a business from one level to the next and at that next level selling to the bigger fish above you. So self-funded searchers are selling them to small, might, you know, build up their business to sell to a small private equity shop. That small private equity shop might, you know, aggregate a few to sell it to a bigger private, private equity exactly. shop. And on and on and on. I mean, this is kind of the, this is kind of the game. It's just it, what strata do you play in? And my audience is playing at the kind of, at the, at the individual our partner strata down down at kind of a, you know not infinitesimally small but kind of the smallest below private equity so and even those uh, like big trash companies i mean they're nothing more than a private equity company i mean they're buying companies leveraged on debt and like waste management isn't doing this but the like next level down i mean waste connections model is that of private equity so they're a huge mm -hmm trash company but they're still in that same mindset of just buying these companies leveraged on debt great point how does somebody do this and not have to drive the truck <laughs> how does somebody <laughs> honest question i know it sounds like prissy and well you know you want to make five <laughs> yeah. million dollars get your ass in the truck dude <laughs> But, um, but, but is there, is there, I mean, I guess the answer of course is buy a big enough business, but not too big that you don't have to be the person going out in the truck. That's pretty simple answer, that, huh? I think that, yeah, that, that is the answer at a small level that I started at. You're going to, you, you, you have to be able to get in that truck because I don't think that you would be able to, unless you don't want to make money, right? Like, um, you had a 
the tree guy from Las Vegas who was like, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, like, you know, I have my business over here that I really focus on. I bought this tree company um, and he wasn't looking to make like a bunch of money right. out of it. He was looking to grow it. So right. if you weren't looking to make your living out of this and you could put an operator in and you just wanted to grow it for the final outcome, then, yeah, you just need to find the business and the operator. But Mm -hmm. I think the difficult part there is eventually your operator is going to be like, hey, man, I'm running your whole business here and you're going to have a problem on your hands. Right. Right. So he would have to be uh, he would have to have equity or he would have to have some kind of interest that's going to keep him there. Um, But the the other answer is buy two or three small ones. If you can buy two or three small ones in the same area, then it's already ready for that layer of management. Um, I guess the hard part would be there is that you would have to be able to evaluate someone to put in that spot. Hopefully you would keep maybe one of the owners um, on. So a lot of times like when private equity buys a trash company, they don't come and buy the whole thing. They buy... 70 80 percent the original owner keeps 20 percent and now he's interested to have the next outcome in five years so you'd probably have to run the same model patrick what an education let's close out uh there's one uh, more thing i wanted to talk about yeah is that all right Uh, it sure is um so we started this whole thing with do you need an mba do you need private equity experience to do this and i'm saying no um and a lot of times when I talk to people who come from my blue collar background and they say like, you know, I have this idea, but I don't know, like, I don't have the experience to run a business. I kind of just, I have a sister who asked me about a business idea and she says, well, you know, I don't know anything about accounting. accounting. And I say, yeah, that's why they have accountants. I don't know anything about mm-hmm. accounting either. Right. So mm-hmm. I would say if you are someone who wants to go out and buy a business, you and you're an operator and you know you can operate the business, but you don't know the backside of the business. You don't know the business side of the business. That's what accountants are for. That's what insurance agents are for. You trust the accountant. You trust the insurance agent. You are the operator and you quarterback all the other stuff so that you can be successful. You don't need to know all that other stuff. That's you know why people go to law school. Mm-hmm. So I think that's like a, decent piece of advice that a lot of people don't ever think about. Amen. It's great advice. And, and is, is there something in there too about people who don't have an MBA listening to this podcast and maybe feeling intimidated because they see these other people who do have MBAs? Is that kind of where you were going with this as well? Well, I think it's blue collar workers are going to think to themselves like, Oh, well, yeah, I know that I can, actually run this landscaping company but like am i do i understand how to get the financing or do i understand like how to build the website like and i think a lot of people think that because you own the business like you know how to do all that stuff and they don't just think about the fact that no you can pay people to do this stuff for you and you don't need to know everything you just need to find people that you trust and it's no different than a ceo who builds a team the CEO doesn't know like every single aspect that's going on in the finance department. That's what the CFO does. And as a small business owner, it's a small company, but still you need to build that team in the background that to be successful. Right. So in my, what I did is all the people that I met when I worked for Joe, his insurance guy, um, I called them all when I was going to buy my business. And I just said, Hey, you know, we met when through Joe and I'm buying this trash company and can you help me do this? Every single one said yes. Mm-hmm. You know, like there wasn't, everyone was just like, yeah, sure. Yeah, I did this for Joe and now I'll do it for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a, a big thing for uh, those of us who didn't, you know, go to uh, get our, didn't, aren't highly educated that, you know, we don't have, we don't need to know it all. Such a good point. Such a good point, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you for making that. What else? I see you glancing at notes. Was there something else <laughs> that we wanted? Seriously? No. Is there I, any, I, anything else? No, that's it. That's all I got. All right. Well, I want to hear about the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> 
is is this business uh is is there still the organized crime element in this industry that uh, it has a reputation for yeah in my experience i never openly ran into it so i wouldn't like is it there yes can you avoid it yes very easily you can avoid it i think that different areas of the country probably have like different issues with it um i think that in a small company you can totally exist and not run into it um i never ran into it obviously where i live the mafia is not around so um i don't think the mafia is as interested in trash as they used to be because there's no cash in the business anymore so Mm -hmm. it's not as easy to move money through the business um everything's paid by credit cards and stuff like that so um in in my experience i never ran into it but sometimes maybe i think my eyes were closed if that makes sense like if i maybe opened my eyes a little bit more i could have seen it but no i never presented with it i was talking Mm -hmm. to someone um a little bit ago and they were like yeah i mean if you ran into the mob they would give you a warning they would tell Mm. you somehow like you don't want to do this and Mm. um you would then heed to that warning but (laughs) (laughs) um i was talking to a guy one time and he was stealing a bunch of customers off of this guy and the guy just gave him a phone call and said hey you may want to look up my background before you steal another one of my customers. And he said he looked him up, found out who he was, and stopped taking his customers. Wow. So, I mean, but, I mean, that was a very nice way of dealing with it. (laughs) Yeah. I I mean, it could have been way worse. I didn't, not a single kneecap involved. (laughs) Um, Well, so, so the takeaway is probably in certain corners, there's a little bit of it nothing like it used to be and probably also very regionally confined to to states or, or localities that people probably associate with the mafia um and but for most people listening to this podcast and who might actually contemplate buying a trash business probably not probably a non-issue yeah i'd say i mean if you just think about the large companies that are involved in this business and the fact that like private equity is running all over this business the the mob can't yeah. exist right so right. the fact right. that all these That's big businesses are in the industry, like it has to be legit because on the lower level. So again, if I was involved with the mafia, I would want my operation to be a couple trucks, just fly under the radar. You know what I'm saying? You're mm-hmm. not going to mm-hmm. build, build this huge, massive business up in my opinion, but yeah, it's totally local and um, you could totally exist in this business and be extremely successful and never even know what was in the background patrick norris what a delight uh i feel like i uh know a lot about the trash business and i love that you uh, in five years made five million dollars for yourself um starting as a guy who was on the back of a trash truck uh way back earlier in his career just very very inspirational i think the audience is going to love it how can people reach out if they want to ask you a question uh linkedin patrick norris i'm there uh it's basically it um i appreciate the opportunity um that you gave me here to speak and i really enjoy the podcast i as a person who's not highly educated i guess i would say um i learn a lot from it constantly when i'm listening so if this was like eye-opening to me when i found your podcast at like I didn't know what search was, never heard of it before until I started listening to your podcast. Um, so, you know, I learn a lot every single time I listen. That's great. I appreciate that, Patrick. Uh, and by the way, why, why are you driving a truck when you got $5 million to go out and buy a lot of businesses? Seriously. <laughs> um, Something tells me you like this. You like the work. You like the work. Uh, oh, I love the work. Um I go. do enjoy trucks. I enjoy um, the, you know, I, the, I would love to be in business again. Um, and maybe I will. I think the reason I listen to your podcast is because mm. I'd like to open my eyes to other opportunities that aren't the trash business. Um, I obviously have a five-year non-compete in the trash business, so I can't go 
back into the trash business for a couple more years. Um, and I think some of it is, you know, I had this pretty intense five and a half years and for a year now, I've just been driving a truck for myself and it's a little bit of a break and maybe recharge the battery so I can go do it again. Cool. Well, keep listening to Acquiring Minds to get inspired about your next, your next chapter. Um, you'll probably get some inbound from this one. Uh, I just had a great time. So thank you very much, Patrick. Thanks for so much time. We're, we're pretty long here, but, uh, uh, just couldn't stop myself. So really appreciate it, sir. Thank you. You have a good day. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Make sure you subscribe to the Acquiring Minds channel below. We are now publishing twice a week. So tons of new interviews and stories to come, stories that will help you along your own path to acquiring a business.